Well, welcome back um, everyone to our second hemp production webinar um, in our, our 2021 series. Um, we've added a third webinar that will occur next week with Seth Crawford from Oregon CBD. He'll be talking about um, seedless triploid hemp varieties. So excited to hear about that. But today, um, Gretchen has returned. And of course, I should have said one more time, Gretchen, shiny penny. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm, yeah, <laughs> Gretchen Schimmelfenig. <laughs> Shimmel Fenning, um, who's a physical engineer with um, our, I always say R11. Is that right? It's not. No, it's it's RII, Resource <laughs> Innovation Institute. Yep. Oh, and I'm actually a professional engineer in, in civil engineering. So, oh, well, yeah. there we go. So that's yeah, what I get for make. I'm making up my own titles and even <laughs> of where you work. No worries. <laughs> um, really glad to be back. Thank you for inviting me again. Yeah, well, um, so Gretchen's going to be talking about hemp irrigation systems, and it's a question that comes up a lot because many of our hemp growers and many farmers in the Northeast are not, not used to irrigating. So we're hoping that you can give us some tips on um, hemp water usage and developing efficient um, and accurate and high quality irrigation systems. So I'll, I'll just let you go. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, I think this is gonna be a really juicy um, subject and I hope that everybody can come up with some good questions and populate the chat as I'm going. I'm going to be sharing some insights from our cannabis water report that we published with the New Frontier Data and Cannabis, Berkeley Cannabis Research Center as well as some best practices that are emerging in the um, cannabis and hemp market. So excited to share how we can make these the most relevant best practices for Vermont New England for hemp growers. So I'm gonna cover um, some central tenets of water management for growing any sort of plant, but in specifics uh, for cannabis and hemp, we're gonna talk about sourcing water, treating it, storing it perhaps, fertigating the concept of both irrigating and providing nutrients to the plant, wastewater and managing that by um, perhaps understanding how draining and recapturing water can be strategies for your uh, processes. And then we'll finish up with some benchmarking concepts and talk about the benefits of monitoring, uh, uh, quantifying and ranking different key performance indicators for water efficiency and productivity and how to optimize those to minimize impacts and costs for your business. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about RII at the beginning. I'm your technical and operations director from RII speaking about science-based positions that we gather from our technical advisory council. I'm not just individually speaking on these. These are peer reviewed positions and also supported by data that we gather from our PowerScore resource benchmarking platform. You can definitely send me an email at Gretchen at resourceinnovation.org. I'm taking some time off in May, but our team would be happy to um, handle your questions while I'm gone. I'll tell you a little bit about us first. We are a nonprofit organization that brings stakeholders together to understand the nascent cannabis cultivation and controlled environment agriculture markets. Since 2016, we've been measuring key performance indicators for resource efficiency and productivity to create benchmarks and baseline the industry so that we can understand high performance strategies. We then are informing actors like governments, utilities, industry supply chain actors, and helping understand best practices, um, informing policies, designing and improving programs and creating standards for equipment and processes so that um, cultivators can get recognized for excellence. And lastly, we use that information to verify specific processes like technologies and techniques like I'm sharing today about for specifically irrigation, but on many other topics like HVAC, lighting and, um, and benchmarking in general. So we've been around since 2016 and we're um, based in Portland, Oregon. I'm based in Vermont. We have staff in the Chicago and Denver areas as well. So we're across the country and have expertise in a number of areas that we're bringing to this market to help improve it for the betterment of the people and the planet and expanding beyond just cultivation as well as cannabis. Um, with a new USDA grant, we are um, taking what we know about cannabis and providing resource efficiency best practices guidance to other crops like strawberries, lettuce, and more grown in indoor environments and greenhouses. We have uh, over 70 member organizations from lots of different areas of the industry 
um, members locally like Efficiency Vermont, as well as nationally. And we hope to encourage you to connect with us to understand how you can maybe get connected to some of those best practices um, being implemented in the market. The Technical Advisory Council of RII guides standards, shapes our tools and resources, and advocates for informed policies through different working groups on subject matters like HVAC, lighting controls, and water policy data. We also have had a utility working group that helps um, utilities across the country and even in Canada to understand how to best provide energy efficiency programs for cultivators. We have three new working groups in 2021. And um, I'll talk a bit about how the water working group helped develop some of these benchmarks today and how you can um, compare yourself against these benchmarks in our power working platform. Power since 2017 and has hundreds of cultivator records that have voluntarily submitted information to step on the scale and compare themselves to other growers like them. There's performance benchmark reports for individual facilities using a year of data. You can also use it to establish what maybe a design benchmark might be. And you can compare your portfolio facilities across many sites or maybe multiple years of data. Utilities and other actors are using it to measure and verify efficiency and productivity before and after projects and also to inform energy models. So if you'd like to learn more about PowerScore, please do reach out and you can check it out at cannabispowerscore.org. We publish our best practices guidance that help, uh, is helped, peer, helped, developed and peer reviewed by our Technical Advisory Council in our um, resourceinnovation.org slash resources repository where you can find the LED lighting, HVAC and Massachusetts specific best practices guidance. And we publish other reports for our membership. And I'm gonna talk specifically about the cannabis water report today. Before that, I'm going to talk about the main processes that are involved in water management for hemp production. And then we'll talk about the findings from the cannabis water report and how that may be able to be related to your New England operation. There are several different activities that happen when you're cultivating cannabis, and you may do one or more of these activities, and these activities use water. Most of them are going to be using water in the propagation, vegetation, and flowering stages, and maybe you grow genetics, and that can also use water as well. Um, depending on what you're doing um, to value add your product, you may use more water down the line, but primarily we're going to be talking about the top of the list today. We're also going to be talking about several industrial hemp products, including smokable flour, flour that may be used for extracts, genetics, hemp fiber or oil seed. And I will mention that the cannabis water report is primarily focused on smokable flour or flour for extraction. So we'll talk about flour-based benchmarks, but if flour isn't your final product, you can still think of how these benchmarks might be evolved for your final product. When sourcing water, <laughs> It's important to understand what water are you using and from where? Are you using a natural source like a private well? Are you using a municipal source? Are you getting it from a different private source and working out an agreement? Is it being delivered to you? Is it fresh water that is um, good enough to drink or is it non-potable water? Are you taking water that's maybe been recirculated from another process like your drained water or water from an HVAC system like condensate being reclaimed? Or are you using a constant source like a um, natural surface water diversion or a seasonal source like rain? So there's a lot of questions and Vermont doesn't necessarily have a water shortage issue, but depending on your harvest goals, you may want to improve your source water quality and the place that that water is coming from is going to affect that quality. So there's some figures from the cannabis water report on the right here. You can see in figure 10, Power score is the national data set that we have from Cannabis Power Score. And you can see a variety of sources being used, both potable and non-potable. And then in figure in 11 and 12, you can see by indoor greenhouse and outdoor production styles, the different uh, portion, proportions of growers that are using um, potable sources or non-potable sources. So if, if you're growing outdoor hemp, you might be getting it mostly from a private well or delivered water or if you're using a non-potable water source, you might be using a variety of different natural surface water, rainwater, rivers, streams, ponds, lakes. Most outdoor growers are not using HVAC systems, so they're not probably recapturing HVAC condensate. And some growers might not find it um, financially or uh, environmentally cost-effective to uh, treat drained water, but we'll talk more about that in a second. So 
On the bottom left, you can see some major sources of water. And the main point from this slide is to think about how is water quality going to be impacted by the water source that I'm using and how might I affect that water quality. To affect water quality, treating water, there are a lot of different options that you can use when um, growing hemp and thinking about the processes that you might use, maybe a physical treatment option like sediment, maybe a chemical treatment option like an oxidizing agent, maybe a biological option um, like a bioswale, some sort of vegetated um, wetland that you can use to clean water um, that can't be recirculated. So after you source your water, you have some options of perhaps filtering and then doing maybe a second stage of um, treatment and the Cannabis Water Report contains some insights from that have been adapted from the Water Treatment Guide for Greenhouses and Nurseries. That's a very good resource. And so I recommend checking this out and thinking about, if I haven't checked out my water quality first, let's test it. And then once I get some results, what are the options that I have that are going to be maybe the most environmentally beneficial, but most uh, cost-effective for me? Um, we have members at RII who are experts in water treatment. So if you have questions about water treatment options, specific to Vermont, please send me an email and I'd be happy to field them to folks who might have a, a good answer for you. In Vermont, it may not be as important to store water, but in the Cannabis Water Report, there's a data set from Northern California and those growers definitely have need to store water. Um, depending on your peak irrigation periods and needs in Vermont, you may still also choose to store water. And so storing water may be sensible to do when we have great amounts of water in, um, in rainy seasons, and then thinking about how to uh, use that later when you have peak irrigation needs in the summertime um, may be something to think about, but not a heavy, uh, a heavy uh, need in Vermont, I would say. However, this is one that I wanted to focus more on is the, the focus of this webinar, irrigation. And so, uh, the term fertigation is used in the Cannabis Water Report, and so I've used it here as well to remind folks that when you combine irrigating with just water and combine your nutrients with that, you end up fertilizing, fertigating irrigation. So the word is fertigation, if you haven't encountered it before. And the main message from this slide is about how substrate, the, the, the grow media that you're using for your cannabis plants, how that can affect the amount of runoff, i.e. the water that runs out of the um, pot or um, does not stay inside the plant's soil and it wastes nutrients in the natural resource of water. And so we're just going to talk a little bit about how those different substrate options that you might encounter when, when cultivating hemp can affect that what's called leach percentage. So that's how much of the water that you apply, how much you irrigate or fertigate that just drains out the bottom of the pot. So we've got some options. If you're growing outdoors, you're likely using a, some sort of soil mix. You might not be doing any additives, but if you're using a container grow, you might be adding or using a mix of cocoa core, maybe some peat, other amendments, compost, sand, um, vermiculite, perlite. Um, there's a lot of different mixes that are out there um, and that you might be using. And that's going to be something that'll affect the drainage of the plant. So more, more things like perlite or vermiculite might allow for more water to um, more gaps in the soil, but might also allow for um, more drainage. Rock wool is a more popular option when um, growing cannabis indoors um, or in greenhouses. I'm not sure if there are a lot of rock wool users on, um, in Vermont, but there's a great detail of rock wool in the Cannabis Water Report if you're interested in evaluating it and, um, and how there might be benefits or disadvantages for using that material. Water culture, um, growing plants directly in water or directly in um, air that's moistened to keep the plants uh, continuously uh, nutriented. That's also an option that's more often used in indoor. That might be something that you do in earlier stages of plant cultivation for younger plants, but we'll focus mostly on the uh, more common options, which we've, uh, I thought I had a graph of here, <laughs> um, but if you have some uh, thoughts on what you're commonly using and how that might be impacting uh, water usage for you, let me know. But you can see on the bottom right that there's some notes about leach percentage for cocoa coir, for peat, and then obviously for hydroponic systems, there's the constant recirculation. So there's no leach percentage. And so when thinking about that drained water, that leach or the amount of water that's coming out of the substrate, um, the irrigation approach that you use when applying water to that substrate affects that runoff. So a quote from the Cannabis Water Report says, depending on watering techniques, 25% or more 
of water that is applied drains as runoff. And so the question is, are you going to allow that water to drain to waste? Or is there a potential for you to reuse that water? Depend depending on whether you're watering in containers or whether you're watering out in the field or whether you're watering in some sort of hydroponic system, there's definitely different opportunities. But I have some quotes here about the um, water savings available when um, switching from hose watering to drip irrigation um, or hose watering to sensor-based irrigation with maybe micro sensors using pulsing. So compared to using a hose to irrigate plants or a flood and drain technique, which can be obviously water intensive when described as flood, um, the precise targeting of drip irrigation can reduce water consumption by 30 to 70% and improve water productivity by 20 to 90%. And we'll talk about water productivity as a benchmark in the next section. So that's a very considerable savings. And I think that if any takeaway from this webinar is out there, I think that considering drip irrigation systems, if you do not already have them is one. And then if you already have a sort of drip irrigation system, but don't have sensors involved, I think there's also a great um, opportunity incorporating sensors to use even more um, efficient options and uh, use even less water. So with equal to better crop yields. So you're not going to affect um, crop production, you're just gonna reduce your resource consumption. So let's talk a bit about benchmarking and how hemp resource efficiency for water can be impacted by irrigation. And maybe what are the benchmarks out there that Vermont, uh, Vermont growers can run with as they're uh, evaluating themselves against their peers. So on the right is a facility benchmark report from Cannabis Power Score that shows energy benchmarks as well as water benchmarks and below that waste benchmarks. So we'll focus just on the water ones here. You can see that there's a facility and uh, water efficiency metric of 114 gallons per square foot and a water productivity metric of you know, almost three grams per gallon. So those are two examples of resource efficiency and resource productivity key performance indicators. And you can do this with any sort of resource. It can even be something that's um, more important to you, like a amount of fertilizer applied and amount of grams of cannabis produced with that uh, amount of nutrient. Um, other folks like to use full, um, full footage of entire facilities, not just flowering canopy. So there's lots of different numerators and denominators you can consider when making key performance indicators for your production op operation. But for today's example, we're going to run with these uh, efficiency and productivity for water where we have, you know, resource per unit of canopy area and then units of biomass produced per unit of resource. Um, if you want to access this report, you can go to resourceinnovation.org slash resources. Um, you can also go to info.newfrontierdata.com slash cannabis dash H2O. And um, we are really excited to have a um, very heavily contributed peer reviewed and brand agnostic guide for you to check out and would love to hear your feedback. We published the 2018 Cannabis Energy Report as well with data from PowerScore, electricity only data, and we hope to do a full all energy report soon. So let's keep talking about water. Um, this image is a similar one to the one that I was kind of walking you through with the other water management slides where we have it all in one area. We've got water being sourced, water being treated, water being stored, water going into a fertigation system, water being irrigated onto plants, plants then having runoff, runoff then going to a discharge area where it's maybe being treated and then um, either reused or uh, waste after being treated. So you've removed the environmentally adverse things from it before then putting it back into the environment. And there are other water uses on this, including you know, climate control for maybe a more environmentally uh, controlled area like a greenhouse or indoor grow, as well as other things that might happen in an operation like cleaning or sanitation. So for this webinar, we are gonna mostly focus on the irrigation aspects of it, but we're gonna dive into the water efficiency water productivity and water demand key performance indicators. So remember gallons per square foot of canopy, we normalize to flowering canopy because you don't wanna double count all of the different um, stages that the plant goes through. So we kind of normalize to the final stage of plant growth. If that's vegetation canopy for you, use that. Um, productivity, grams per gallon. And then this last one um, that wasn't on the power score slide but was used for the cannabis water report is water demand. So gallons per year, gallons per month, and comparing those from uh, different grow styles as well as different locations. 
And the major message from the Cannabis Water Report is that opportunities to recapture water and reuse water can improve efficiency. And then I think another message that's going to be the, the one for you all to take away is that consider how you irrigate and at the start, reduce the amount of water that needs to be recaptured and reused by reducing the amount of water that is irrigated without affecting crop yield by considering changing from host watering to drip irrigation or micro pulse irrigation using sensors. So some information from the cannabis water report is shown here. Um, Marijuana Business Daily did this nice graphic showing, you know, gallons per plant is a regulatory option that's been used in areas like in California. And due to the amount of variability in plant density, size, and cultivation period, it's kind of like a nonsensical uh, benchmark to run with because it doesn't compare apples to apples. And so we offered these three new benchmarks and the data is shown here for outdoor greenhouse and indoor grows for productivity, efficiency, and demand. And so an outdoor grow can grow three grams of flour per gallon, whereas a greenhouse or indoors may be getting a bit more grams per gallon. However, uh, they also as outdoor are really beating the tar out of any other uh, operation growing greenhouse or indoor in terms of the amount of uh, water efficiency that can be accomplished with an outdoor grow at you know, around 11 gallons per flowering carrying a few square foot compared to 80 gallons per flowering canopy square foot for a greenhouse. Um, outdoor and greenhouse demand is pretty much exactly the same, um, at least for our data sets, but indoor using more um, water per year, water per month. Similarly, you can see uh, in the graphic on the far right, average annual water use of grows from PowerScore, from the California data set and from a, uh, from a Michigan data set. You can see the indoor grows are using a lot more water. I will note that those are also producing more harvests per year. So one of the benchmarks that I think um, for future water benchmarking reports is going to be us normalizing to harvests as well so that we can start to really compare apples to apples. If someone grows four harvests a year per, compared to six, they're not going to have their benchmarks be um, you know, nonsensically compared. So the cannabis water benchmarks continue here with both cannabis cultivation growth in indoor greenhouse and outdoor styles, from 2017 through 2025, seeing how that's just going to be growing in the future years, as well as how that's going to ultimately bear out in water use. So um, these are not exactly the same. You see the bottom left shows legal, illicit, and total legal and illicit markets. And that contains all of the indoor greenhouse and outdoor grows and shows how the growth in cannabis cultivation market is going to grow the water use of the industry. The two key performance indicators that inform those forecasts are the water productivity and water efficiency values that you see on the bottom right. And these are again, national data sets with about a dozen different states represented. And you can see that if you'd like to start benchmarking yourself and measuring grams per gallon or gallons per square foot, you can see that um, like we mentioned before, outdoor can get about three grams per gallon. Outdoor can get about 11 gallons per square foot. And then if you're growing in a greenhouse, you're gonna have different numbers to compare against of about five grams per gallon and about 80 gallons per square foot. So I didn't have a really long presentation today because I mostly wanted to field some more questions, but I wanna understand you know, how New England producers envision improving water efficiency and productivity to compete and be more resilient, regardless of the fact that we have ample water in perhaps Vermont. And also regardless of the fact that in our analysis, we found that the cannabis cultivation industry is not using a huge amount of water compared to other industries. You can see that about at about 2.2 billion gallons of year, uh, gallons of water per year, we're only comparing ourselves to about just a day and a half at, a, at any all US golf courses or an hour at Niagara Falls. So um, comparing to livestock farming, two billions 2 billion gallons per day compared to cannabis 2 billion gallons per year. You can also see on the far right, the um, these are California crops comparing against each other. Cannabis is not the worst out there. It's smaller than even berries um, when looking at the data. And so uh, when folks are talking about which crops to demonize or say are like the hogs of, of resources, it's not, it's not hemp and it's not um, water. So at least in this initial analysis, so my message here is that how do Vermonters growing hemp 
want to compete and become more resilient as the market, as you can see in the bottom left, the market value of both flour and trim is compressing. And that's something we've seen um, in, at RII being from Portland, Oregon with a um, oversupplied market that had cost compression that required uh, cultivators to reduce their operational expenses. This could be something that um, might be sensible to consider now before the market compresses further. Sorry, I'm trying to go to the chat here. So um, yeah, I just, I'm going to go back to some of the earlier slides now that we've seen some of these benchmarks. So you can see we've got, you know, running with that three grams per gallon, 11 gallons per square foot for outdoor grow, knowing that most of you might be seasonally growing outdoors. So we'll go back to the top. What water are you going to use from where? So thinking about what source that might limit you know, how much, how much can you pull from a certain source when? Um, maybe you're dealing with a seasonal source and you might need to store it. And so thinking about um, how much water are you going to gather at the top? Um, and that's going to affect your benchmarks. What water may also affect your benchmarks because you might need to treat it and that might um, involve more cost. So if you're thinking about certain sources, how is that going to impact perhaps your, treat, perhaps your treatment options? Um, there are different types of treatment options that also might use energy. So think about how those water energy nexus concepts might affect you. Storing water is not going to affect a usage benchmark, but it will water fall down to it. So if you store a lot of water and then you do use it, um, that's going to end up being in your grams per gallon. Um, it's also thoughtful to think about how much storage do you really need do it and not to overstore. But going back to the fertigation slide, I am curious to hear if anybody in the audience has thoughts on how maybe their substrate choices um, could be affecting how much water they use and whether switching to a different irrigation approach or a different substrate could be um, optimal to improve benchmarks. And so taking a spin on cannabis power score before you change a fertigation approach, before you change a substrate option could be really helpful to understand, am I getting a better grams per gallon out of this new approach or should I stick with what I have been doing before? Um, leach percentage is something that might be able to be monitored with a sensor system. And so I do recommend that if you're trying to understand how much your watering rate is and how much leach you're having, it's really something that you can't eyeball and it should, should be something that you're measuring with some sort of device. And that way you can benchmark over time, not only your total grams per gallon or gallons per square feet of water efficiency and productivity, you can also know your true watering rate as well as your true drainage in your leach. Um, runoff, again, may uh, be up to 25% of your irrigated water. And so if you're going back to that calculation of what water and when and how much of it, am I gonna have to treat it? Am I going to have to store it? Thinking about then when you're applying it, if you're wasting 25% of it, think about if I use a better technique, I can reduce the amount of water I need to source, treat, and store in the first place. So um, yeah, I don't have a huge amount of content left to present. I was hoping to get some more questions um, because truly I think that with hemp irrigation practices, there's a diversity of out there um, depending on the water you're using from where and the type of hemp you're growing. So going back to the earlier slide of what product, are you growing out in a field like this? Um, are you going to be hand watering that? Are you going to be using booms? Are you going to be uh, running irrigation lines out? Um, these are things to think about and ones that the UVM extension is definitely happy to hear from you about and to provide some guidance. Um, so I'd like to see if we've got some more. Hmm. What kind of startup? Uh, the question in the chat is what resources are there for funding startups for irrigation, um, like irrigation technology to improve uh, efficiency. I, I think that there are some Vermont innovation, uh, like I know that there's the climate, there's like a Vermont climate, yeah, Delta Climb VT is a business accelerator. 
serving startup and seed ventures focused on climate economy innovation. That's one that I'm familiar with from when I worked at Burlington Electric Department and that um, is a Vermont based program. So that one I do think would be one that would help get a connection to climate, energy and resource efficiency. So um, yeah, sorry that, sorry that was a kind of uh, random response, but that is one that I've encountered before and it may, may be one to investigate. Um, there's also grants like the Lintelac Foundation that are focused on water. Um, so there might be an opportunity there to get grant funding. And then if you're a hemp business yourself, uh, thinking about getting help with irrigation, I would always recommend reaching out to folks like Efficiency Vermont. Um, even if it's not an energy project, they would love to hear from you to give you technical assistance and maybe get you connected to the best practitioners who can help install or design a system for you. Hey Gretchen, it's Heather. I was wondering, um, do you know when the, I don't know if I saw this in, in one of your slides, but when's the highest uptake of water in a hemp plant's life? Is it similar to other crops, you know, as um, kind of, as flowering kind of begins like right before that, or is it even throughout the season? That's a great question. And um, one that the cannabis water report didn't dive into down like to a life cycle assessment of uh, what stage of the plant is contributing the most. But I'm going to share with you, um, I'm just gonna get to a different, um, uh, We just published a new um, article in Greenhouse Grower that might have a bit of the detail that you're interested in. So um, we worked with a couple of folks from Signify as well as um, the greenhouse manager of Purdue. And here's a little bit of some of the detail that you might be interested in. So um, it doesn't talk about perhaps, that, so there's, let me explain the, the table. So there's different watering controls uh, scenarios. The column vegetative is for younger plants, generative is for older flowering plants, and then the ranges of control values columns is the kind of commentary. And so to Heather, to your question of like, are plants using more water most later in the stages, you can see that irrigation cycle length and frequency. In the vegetative stage, they're, they're, they're wanting shorter, higher bursts of water. Whereas when they're older, they want longer, but lower volumes of water. And so you can see the kind of milliliter ranges there. And so I would say that the flowering plants are going to the higher ends of that range, um, sorry, for the lower ends of that range, but for longer periods. And maybe the vegetative plants are going at the higher ends of that range, but for shorter periods. Great, thank you. I know um, <clears throat> one of the challenges one of the challenges I've seen with folks trying to figure out how to manage irrigation is um, how much, you know, how much should I put on every day or once a week? And are there any calculators um, out there that you know of? Um, we used to do sort of these and still do, I guess, off the cuff <laughs> calculations for other crops, you know? So if we get an inch of rain in a given week, um, we know, that week we need to irrigate X number of gallons of water um, to meet the crop's demand. Do you know if there's anything available like that? Maybe not just for hemp, but in general, sort of those calculators people can use? That's a great question. And I, I don't have one off the cuff right now, but I, I will bring it back to the, the home base and maybe reach out and get a resource for UVM Extension to to get, it might be something that is going to be a, a supply chain provider. So I'd like to get, I'm sure that there's some water treatment and water like irrigation um, technology providers who have calculators, but I'd want to offer a few of them so they're not, you're not just getting one from, you know, Argus controls or something like that. So there's, yeah. there's that side of it. So there's gonna be supply chain folks who have design tools. Then there was the rule of thumb that's been cursing a lot of cannabis growers in California, like the six gallons per plant per day number. And that is ultimately why we published the cannabis water report because that number isn't 
uh, reflective of the size of plants that kind of can be grown in different regulated markets. So when, when plants are regulated at a per plant level, they grow into the size of trees because the growers are trying to optimize each biomass from each plant. So um, let me get back to you about the calculator question. The rule of thumb question is one to, I think, try and maybe steer away from because uh, every grow is kind of different and the cultivar, the location, the substrate, like I mentioned, the irrigation uh, approach, those are going to affect that. And so the calculator should have those as kind of parameters that are able to be drop downs. Um, I'm going to mention in the cannabis water report, there are some numbers that you can run with, for example, cocoa coir. Coir irrigation can range between one and 12 water application events per day, but that depends on the size of the pot. Um, rock wool um, often is going to have up to 20 irrigation events a day. This is going to have a smaller irrigation event, uh, large uh, pulses of water for shorter amounts of time. But then things like peat are going to require lower frequency but higher volume irrigation strategies. Um, uh, you know, rock wool can be a kind of race car, and so some of them can be watered less, or some of them can be watered more, and some things have constant application. So um, I wish I had a quick and easy answer for you, Heather, but I will get back to you about whether there's some calculators out there. Um, that's the question that comes up a lot with energy too. People are like, oh, well, I want to understand how much energy I'm going to use from my cannabis grow because I'm doing X, Y, and Z. But it often comes down to not just the nameplate information, but how, how people do it in practice. So um, I think that's why I mentioned sensors. So if you can do something even very simple, it doesn't even have to be a sensor, but maybe like uh, measuring, like for example, uh, I knew a lot of people are measuring the amount of water they use for irrigation by just how often are they having to refill a tank or how often are they having to, um, just a measuring a volume of uh, some sort of event. And that will help you understand like ultimately how much per plant it might be doing, or if you want to more normalize it to canopy square feet, which we did in the cannabis water report, then you can compare against others like with that the, the benchmarks that are in the slides here. Great, thanks. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions in mm -hmm. the chat box. Yeah, let me, I'm gonna go to the one at the top here about is drip irrigation a preferred technique to minimize yeast slash mold growth, in particular reducing splattering on soil microbes and keeping plant drier? Yes, I, I would agree. Like you, um, for example, even non cannabis like cucurbits, like melons and cucumbers and like not getting the water on the plant's leaf is a benefit um, of the drip irrigation process, a kind of like a non uh, resource use benefit. And so yes, um, you can, for the cannabis plant, you're probably going to be minimizing things like powdery mildew if you're not um, doing hose watering as much. Um, question on pH and filtering slash amendments. I'm currently growing seasonally outside using well water that's coming around at kind of a high pH for cannabis eight to 8.4 and over a hundred TDS. I've had to use a reverse osmosis system for hydroponic projects. Even with pH amendments in the water, the pH will creep back up on its own, especially when oxygenated. How important is it to use RO and or other filtered or pH amended water with an outdoor grow? They seem to be fine without, but figure may improve with a better pH water. This is a very good question. I'm gonna take a sip of water. So there's a whole section on reverse osmosis in the cannabis water report that I encourage you to read because it provides a few insights on reverse osmosis benefits as well as some of the maybe the costs. Um, one of them is, that interested me was that reverse osmosis is not really done by cultivators of most other crops. While we know that cannabis is like a bioaccumulator it is one that is very energy intensive, RO is, and also water intensive in terms of it produces a lot of wastewater. So if we go to the, um, I'm trying to find here, the page. Yeah, so on page 18 of the water report, basically for those of you who are not familiar with reverse osmosis, it's widely used in cannabis facilities to pur purify water. It allows growers to apply uncontaminated water um, by removing pollutants and adulterants. It's especially important in places like, you know, your well water here is having a pH maybe that you would like to be um, lower, but also has some, uh, some things that you'd like to get out of it. Also, because some grows are in certain regions heavily tested for um, heavy metal contaminants, this is a process that's used. So 
The main reasons why RO is not commonly used in other commercial ag is it generates a lot of waste. So for every one gallon of, uh, sorry, uh, it yields one gallon of wastewater brine for every 10 gallons of purified water produced. And it's energy intensive using a lot of electricity and it's significantly more prone to pH fluctuation. This is what I wanted to read for you. So due to its low buffering capacity and lack of bicarbonates, maintaining RO's wa RO water's optimal pH levels requires careful management um, to ensure optimal nutrient absorption. RO water's low TDS content of permeate allows it to absorb gaseous contamin contaminants, which tends to lower pH levels. So it's interesting that yours are still creeping back up. Um, so I wanted to read that because I think that it's an important consideration of maybe why RO is being used in certain grows and why RO might be um, one even that you're doing in an outdoor grow. Um, I'm considering though, maybe the RO isn't what's uh, affecting your pH. Maybe there's some, uh, some improvements that could be made to your pH and I do agree, maybe your biomass production will improve with better pH water for the cannabis plant. I'd love to, if you would write me an email, I'd love to connect you with uh, one of our water treatment members who might have a thought on this and has experience with RO systems. So um, I'm sorry, I don't have a direct answer, but it is interesting to me that the cannabis water report kind of says that the opposite would happen uh, for an RO process. Oh, the non-RO water will creep back up the RO. Will not. Oh, okay, I see. Are you mixing? Um, so that's another thing that is mentioned in here is like how much water are you mixing into your RO water? Um, some cultivators minimize the resource consumption and wastewater production of RO by, by producing just enough RO water to add to their source water to get it to be the right mix and get the right measurements. So it could be that maybe uh, the amount of RO water that you need to be adding to your source water uh, needs to be higher. I'm not sure why the creeping back up is happening and that's why I'm saying I'd like to phone a friend on that one, but I do think that might be something to do with the amount of um, balance between the RO and then your non-RO'd water. The major message though, um, your, your question of like, is it important to use RO or other filtered or pH amended water with an outdoor grow? It could help, but it may not be super cost effective. And depending on what your goal is for your product, your final product may be fine without having the perfect pH. And um, I will say that RO for an outdoor grow may be a little less common than RO for indoor. So if you'd like to get in touch, I'd love to hear from you. Um, next question of soil moisture centers can range quite a bit in cost. Can you briefly discuss the types, costs, pros, cons, etc.? cetera? Um, I did not plan to have a retrospective of the different soil moisture sensors out there. And I also don't claim to be an expert on the ones out there right now. Um, we're currently in the midst of writing the controls best practices guide, which will be our next best practices guide published in July. And that one will have some of this information, but it's not going to be brand specific. It's going to try and be as brand agnostic as possible. And what we will try to do is discuss the types, the ranges of costs and the pros and cons of some of the different types of sensors that are out there, types of controllers. And like I was mentioning the value of data, maybe getting that watering rate information or getting that benchmarking information out of your control systems, out of your sensors, that will be covered in that. So. In terms of uh, your point, yes, they can range quite a bit in cost. And the major message of that is like, you kind of get what you pay for. Perhaps that a sensor is going to be more expensive because it can test for multiple points at once. So maybe you're going to have a sensor that can actually sense not just for moisture, but also for EC, for other things that uh, matter to you. You might even find that um, there are sensor providers, um, some members of ours that have sensors that measure soil, uh, data, and then they've got sensors that measure climate environmental data that can also me measure things like, um, you know, light, light data, and those can all integrate together to, to paint a real picture of what's happening for your grow. So if you want to have an integrated system, that's something that's also going to be covered in the controls best practices guide. But for now, my message would be if you'd like to get in touch and um, ask me specific questions about maybe the soil moisture sensors you're kicking around, I'd be happy to get in touch with some of our technical advisory council members to um, help give a succinct answer for uh, before we publish the controls best practices guide. Great. Well, thanks for the questions. Yeah, these are um, interesting. One, one thing I thought was interesting and maybe I was reading this wrong. Did the data show that it took one gallon of water to produce 
4.7 pounds of flour. Oh, these are grams, I think. Let's see. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah. So here um, we go with grams per gallon. No, I think it was on the one before this. The slide was like, yeah, right there. <clears throat> so, oh, grams of flour per gallon. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i'd love to see a four wow. i'd love to see a four pound per gallon that'd be yeah a i was thinking super very efficient <laughs> and then i will say that um i will say that more state more data is needed um and i know that growers are not keen to share data sometimes but we always report data like this in an aggregate way um and if growers want to understand some of the things like you were saying like am i getting Am I getting a really thirsty flowering stage? I, I don't understand, like, I'd like to compare. We can't really compare and we have until we have people who submit data. So um, if you'd like to participate in Cannabis Power Score, do reach out to me and I'll, I can definitely walk you through what it's like. But um, ultimately it's a voluntary benchmarking platform. Growers from Massachusetts are actually required to use Power Score to comply with their licensure requirements. Is, and so, We've got a good New England data set to compare against. Um, and so uh, one thing I've learned is our data set still has um, some need for even more because like, for example, the indoor uh, 198 gallons per square foot. I got um, information from a person who works directly with a New England grow that had an order of magnitude higher than that. So it's not even really that this is the Bible of what water is like in cannabis. This is a snapshot and we hope that there's yet more to report as we get more data into the pool. And is the power score, is that, that's a program that's run by Resource Innovation Institute or? Yep, it's a, our website is actually going to get knitted together. They're currently separate websites. But okay. Power score is run by RII. It's it's our data platform. It's the way that we claim any sort of credence on being able to say we know what we're talking about in mm -hmm. cannabis specifically. And this is actually the tool that's being crop agnosticified. So it's mm -hmm. going to now be you can benchmark lettuce, you can benchmark hemp, um, but ultimately it's free. You can see that like if a grower in Massachusetts needs to comply for Cannabis Control Commission, that's what they use it for. We also have utilities and design and construction partners using it to benchmark before and after the projects that they do. So we encourage you to reach out and it will start becoming less cannabis specific, but it's never going to lose the cannabis value. Um, I just know growers like in Charlotte, growers that grow both cannabis and non-cannabis crops will now be able to benchmark their entire operation. Well, interesting. I'm wondering if any of the audience has used the cannabis power score so people register yeah you can you, you can make a, an account so that you can save and come back later we're improving mm -hmm. it it's a serve it's a survey based system many many questions are optional but there's yep. also a very very quick and speedy survey if you just want to take the electricity only and a little bit of water questions uh, check out cannabispowerscore.org grow mm -hmm. and then if you'd like to take the one that includes all energy um you can click on cannabispowerscore.org slash pro. But either way, it's a survey-based system. If you'd prefer to do something more like have a call with us and benchmark your uh, facility, yeah. we have staff who are happy to, to do that for you and, um, and to support you. We're with our USDA grant working with growers of all kinds. And, um, and then with the cannabis specific stuff, non-hemp stuff, we will still be doing that like we do with you know Massachusetts cultivators. I will say that the Vermont, um, the, the non hemp, but the, the new legislation coming through for perhaps energy audits and benchmarking might use power score as well. So we have been talking to the Vermont folks and hopefully we'll have voluntary benchmarking be recommended as the approach instead of having on-site energy audits, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. To have people be able to do these things easily um, rather than having a lot of um, time taken up, especially with <clears throat> how hard it is to get this data in the first place. So yeah. 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 But, uh, All right. Well, yeah. I'm wondering if our audience has any more questions for Gretchen. I, she has now joined us twice, which has been great. And we really thank RII for all the work that you're doing in cannabis and beyond. It's been really helpful. Um, 
to us and I'm hoping other people have tapped into the resources as well and Gretchen is right here in Vermont so that's mm -hmm. also very handy and um, yeah and she mentioned a new project that they have with NRCS I believe mm -hmm. right that we're continuing to work on indoor growing I think primarily um, indoor greenhouse um, yeah, like primarily controlled environment agriculture, but we also, that includes high tunnels. So, um, oh, you know, great. yeah, yeah. So we, we can talk about anything really, uh, mostly we're trying to focus on things that are considered resource intensive. That's why the, the you know, the more controlled ag stuff, but we also mm -hmm. are interested in finding strategies that are low resource intensive, like low carbon approaches. So um, interested in, uh, really anything. So if you want to get in touch with us, uh, I'd love to hear from you. And we'd, we'd love to see how we could help maybe support you through the pilot project stage of our grant. And I realize <clears throat> this was not necessarily the focus of your work, but one topic that has come up um, a bit is about the use of plastics in mm -hmm. production. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, especially as we're talking about um, like drip, drip lines, yep. drip irrigation, um, many folks using black plastic mulches. Yep. And yep. Mm -hmm. um, I realized this, you know, I was just thinking about the efficiency of drip irrigation, but then, you know, a lot of drip being, you know, kind of disposable plastic lines. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. thoughts on that or? anything yeah. that you're, you folks are working on in particular? Yeah, so um, I'll show first, if you wanna recall that we have technical advisory council groups, the 2021 groups include emissions and specifically waste as one of those emissions. Waste has been one of the benchmarks that PowerScore gathers since its inception, though it's one of the less mature KPIs. So it doesn't have as many questions about it. It doesn't have as much uh, analytical data going on, but you can see at the bottom of this performance benchmark report that there's a waste efficiency and productivity KPI. I'm sorry, mm. it's cutting off at the bottom, but you can see, you know, around 1.5 pounds of waste per square foot and about 235 grams per pounds of waste. However, we want to get more specific there with like pounds of non-recycled waste, things like that. Um, we ask questions about, do you compost your bio, like, you know, your plant waste? Do you reuse your um, your supplies like trellises and other things like that? Or do you, uh, do you throw away your materials? And so more to come on that one. I'm sorry, we don't have more to say, but we do have two KPIs that are out there. And I'd love for Vermont growers to start using um, those types of metrics so that we can start to improve our power score to to serve the sorts of metrics that matter most to you. We definitely have been asked about that and packaging waste as well. Uh, that comes up for uh, the other types of cannabis production. Um, let me go back here. Yeah, so, so in terms of your question of drip irrigation, the, the kind of push and pull of, okay, well, I can save, you know, 30 to 70% of my water if I switch from hose to drip irrigation, but I also am going to have this new um, kind of plastic emission associated with my business. And so question is, can I find a drip irrigation system that's A, gonna last me maybe longer, I may have to pay more, and I will therefore have a lower emission associated with that. I think that that balance could be worth it. And so, um, however, there's the question of, is the emission side of the business more important to you than the water OPEX side of the business? So if water is free, you aren't worried about being an environmental impact by using the amount of water you do, then yeah, maybe don't bring on more plastic into your business. Um, however, if you've got a desire to reduce water usage and can maybe find a way to offset that amount of you know, plastic being consumed, um, figure out a way to recycle it, uh, that could be a still an environmental benefit, I think. But more to come on waste and we'd love to hear from you. I know that I've been talking with some of the NRCS um, potential pilot project folks, one of the growers is, is concerned about that more than perhaps energy or water. So um, that's something that we're going to be going deeper into. Yeah, I feel like <clears throat> we've been getting calls and I know others have too about the waste <laughs> that's being left in fields. Oh, mm -hmm. just really trying to 
I guess, um, emphasize alternatives if possible, but then also picking up your mess, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. Stewardship. Just thinking about some of those things. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a fair point too, is like um, just thinking of kind of like we've talked about with water, you've got to think about from the beginning to the end and are you going to drain and reuse or, or sorry, are you going to drain to waste or are you going to reuse, recapture and reuse? Same thing could be said for, for the systems that you bring on site and then what are you going to do with them at end of life? Yeah. Or not even just at end of life, end of season and end of life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I know through our program at UVM and our work with, um, John Jemison in Maine as well, just looking at production practices that lessen the use of plastics um, in hemp uh, is part of our strategy. And yeah, so it'll be interesting, I think, um, to see what we find and hopefully you'll be working on similar. <laughs> yeah, similar we should keep in touch. Sounds like. Yeah, we should keep in touch on that because I'd like to understand what are the best practices that are emerging. Um, yeah. You know, are there things that we can start to pilot um, as well? So thank you for bringing it up. Great. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, everybody's hanging on because, you know, it's always great conversation to hear mm -hmm. yeah. um, what others have to say. And I just want to thank Gretchen again. Um, we really appreciate your time and want to invite folks back next week for a presentation from Seth Crawford at Oregon CBD on the development of triploid seedless hemp varieties. I know um, a lot of people have been really excited about that topic, um, us, us as well, which is why we reached out um, to Seth to see if he could join us and give us some insight on these new varieties. We'll also be trialing some of the seedless triploid varieties up at the research farm this year and putting them to the test, um, putting them right next to our grain trials um, to, to see if indeed we'll be able to withstand <laughs> um, cross-pollination. So excited to hear from Seth next week. And with that, um, I don't see any other questions. So I think we'll say goodbye for today and hopefully we'll see you next week. Um, and again, if you have any suggestions for presentation topics, we do have more coming um, on fiber and also um, quality and, and molds, et cetera, that people have been asking about. So we'll have more adding to the lineup soon. All right. Thanks everyone, have a great day.